Sorry, just oh, you're just doing your hair. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are here, we have lunch. Not for you, those of you who are online, obviously, but we have lunch. Please go and, and grab a bite uh, to eat. Uh, if you want, Lucy and, and, and you as well, they're over there, it's all vegan and, and, and all sorts. So um, let's uh, proceed with the programme. So we'll be, we're very honoured to have first keynote from Dr. Alison Khan. I've known Alison for, I don't know, 20 years or more. And we met at Oxford and Alison is still at Oxford and also works for Stanford University. She is um, working there on digital systems um, with um, uh, a new company working with their digital archives. Alison has been very involved in digital learning across the lifespan. We've done several projects together as well. And um, what we hope is that her experience with children will very much feed into working with groups who are perhaps at different levels of information processing, how to capture and how to transmit information uh, to people. Alison's background is in anthropology and digital anthropology. She's got her own company as well, makes wonderful movies, for which she's won many prizes. And we're very lucky because Alison is also a visiting fellow at Loughborough University uh, to further these collaborations, which we hope to establish during this year. Um, Alison, um, let's see, Felicity, can we can we just share the uh, talk for Alison? Or Alison, you are a presenter now, I think, aren't you? So if you would like to share your um, your screen with us. It's really okay. sunny there in Oxford this year, actually. Can, can you hear me well? Am I yeah, loud and clear? Yep. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Eve. And um, it's an absolute honour to be with um, such esteemed uh, fellow researchers and uh, people working directly um, on the coalface with, with everybody who needs some help um, in some way. Now, I'm a visual anthropologist, so, just, so it's quite interesting. Um, so I'm a trained visual anthropologist, but visual anthropology has moved into digital anthropology, as we all have, because um, it's our business to know how people live. And um, so the, one of the, I suppose, the forte of a visual anthropologist is that we look beyond the text. Um, we're really interested in the corporeal um, presentation of culture, of people, um, what they do and how they surround themselves in their daily lives. And it's from looking beyond the text um, at the films people produce, the photographs and uh, art and uh, all sorts of artifacts um, in their in their societies that um, we we try to glean more information um, that's sort of embedded in these productions um, from society. We look at dance as well and ritual, and um, we look at the non-verbal as well. Now. I'm going to give you um, a presentation today looking at how children are learning to be digital in the world. And not just how children, but as our previous uh, speaker quite, quite rightly says, how we as, um, as learners of digital technology are taking on um, all these new innovations at such a speed. Um, and um, so I'm going to try to incorporate my talk with some audio, some visual, I've got a couple of clips of films, and I'm finishing because my main, if you like, takeaway from today is how can anthropologists help in this idea of being inclusive in education, inclusive in the kind of technologies that we're trying to develop? In my company, we're using ethnographic methods to develop platforms for children in state schools to help them organise their knowledge. At the moment, there's so many links for children to understand, not even taken into account learning difficulties, um, COVID showed us, all the um, really unexpected demands of the digital world that we hadn't had previously. So we've really come to this um, perfect storm, but a perfect moment really to, to start really getting down to the point as the, the previous lady 
quite rightly said, what is it for? Is technology actually helping us? Um, and how can it help us? Um, so I'm going to share my screen and quite quickly show you a few clips of film. And please somebody shout if you're not seeing the film. Um, some of it's embedded. And at the end, I've got two clips and I've got a lovely student from India um, at the end who's going to present just a little bit of this wonderful film that she's used as a method to talk about COVID learning in India. So without further ado, um, I will share my screen with you. So share screen and here we go. And can you see? Can you see that? Yeah. Great. Yeah, you can see it. So historical context, and I'm going to outline some of the, well, the essential digital skills, the five essential digital skills that the government has set out that, that they see as necessary for every independent adult to know by the time they get to the workplace. Um, a few findings of what was happening during lockdown and to introduce the ethnographic method, method as a resource for educators and teachers working in education and to introduce ethnographic filmmaking, I think, as another essential tool for us all to know. So let me go ahead um, from here. So 60 years ago, Chronicle of a Summer was made by Jean Roush. Jean Roush was an anthropologist. And the reason he made this film is because he wanted to find out what people were doing post-war in Paris and what kind of society they were living in. Now, he was able to do this in this particular form because sync sound had just been invented. It was the first time that you could actually record and film at the same time. And so I'm going to show you a little short clip because this shows you how social methods have been integrated in visual representations and how we could learn from a classical filmmaker like Jean Rouge. Let me just share with you a few minutes um, which speaks about their experiment. Mais vécu par des hommes et des femmes qui ont donné des moments de leur existence à une expérience nouvelle de cinéma vérité. Comme Morin, euh, l'idée de réunir des gens autour d'une table est une excellente idée. Seulement, je ne sais pas si nous arriverons à enregistrer une conversation aussi normale qu'elle le serait s'il n'y avait pas de caméra. Par exemple, je ne sais pas si Marceline arrivera à se décontracter, arrivera à parler absolument normal. Je peux essayer. Moi, je crois que je vais pas m'expliquer. Pourquoi Parce que je suis un peu timide. Vous êtes, vous êtes intimidé par quoi Je suis intimidée parce que... À un moment donné, il faut être prêt que je ne suis pas forcément. En ce moment, vous n'êtes pas intimidé. Je l'entends tout de suite quand même. Bon, alors, vous n'êtes pas intimidé maintenant. Ce que nous vous demandons, avec une grande ruse, Morin et moi, c'est simplement de parler, de répondre à nos questions. Euh, si vous dites des choses qui ne vous plaisent pas, il est toujours temps de couper. Vous ne voulez pas être intimidé. Mais je suis moi maintenant tout à l'heure parce que je n'ai pas été attaqué de fou, je crois. C'est ce brigand, là. Bon, alors, vas-y, vas-y, moi, bon, attaque. Bon, J'attaque quand même. Je ne sais pas la question qu'on va te poser. Ou même, très précisément, on ne sait pas non plus ce qu'on veut faire avec Rouge. C'est un film sur l'idée suivante. Comment vis-tu Comment vis-tu On commence par toi. Et après, on va s'adresser à d'autres. Comment vis-tu Ça veut dire comment est-ce que tu te débrouilles avec la vie. Et alors, hein, commence par toi, parce que tu vas participer d'une façon très intime à notre entreprise, à notre film, et puisqu'il faut raconter la journée. Par exemple, quand vous levez le matin, que fait vous Quel travail Je fais des enquêtes de psychosociologie dans une boîte 
de psychosociologie appliquée, le travail de faire des interviews, d'analyser ces interviews, éventuellement euh, refaire les synthèses, ce qui m'absorbe quand même pas mal de, de temps, je crois. Ça vous intéresse Non, pas du tout. Lorsque euh, vous sortez dans la rue le matin, oui. est-ce que vous avez une idée de ce que vous allez faire dans la journée Écoutez, il arrive des fois quand je sors dans la rue le matin que j'ai des choses à faire, mais il n'est absolument pas certain que je les fasse. So, no, look at each other. So look at him yeah. One step here and look at me and look at him. Okay. And at three, clap your hands. Three, two, one, clap. There's a house floating. Oh, there's a house floating on your ear. So, so, can you me? Hello? Hi, Alison, you're back Hi. now. I think you Great. lost me for a second. Great. Where did you where did you lose me? Only very, very recently. So it was fine until the end of that last video. So oh, great. Start, start again. Wonderful. OK, so um, disadvantaged pupils tend to have a lower educational attainment compared with their peers. This is often called the disadvantage gap. School closures as a result of the COVID-19 are likely to have widened the disadvantage gap. This is because disadvantaged pupils tend to have less access to technology. They spend less time learning and have reduced support for parents, carers, compared with their peers. If you saw those two last clips, that was 60 years apart almost. Um, so we have um, a lady going into the street at the beginning um, where we're going to see her, her life and she was going to interview people with a microphone for the first time ever. And this was very shocking to the people she was interviewing. Um, 60 years later, children are looking through these virtual glasses. But as educators, where are we? How do we keep up with this technology? School education, from a government perspective, has always aimed at the masses. And up to now, budgets concentrated on facilities, lessons and faculty offered in a physical space. In the 21st century, pupils will be designing education for themselves. 21st century pupils will use platforms that enhance metacognition. Pupils are already designing their own education as they learn to use digital devices and explore apps and games in their daily lives. I'm going to play you an audio clip. Well, um, on, a, on a computer, I'm able to play, play games which can adapt to the computer or it can just be an online game for everyone to play. So if it adapts to the computer, it means that it will save everything that you've done. So if it's like an online thing, it will next time you go on the game, it will delete everything that you've done and it will start over. And some digital some digital skills I know um, is fast typing. Um, and and I know if someone says, can you get this up? I'm most likely going to find it. Because um, because if they if they tell you what they want you to find and you type that up, um, there would normally be a couple hundred questions and saying, do you want this? Do you want that? Do you want this? So there'll be a lot of there'll be a lot of things um, that tell you, uh, do you mean this? Um, is it this you want? So yeah. Okay, so that was a nine-year-old boy telling me how he felt fairly confident and how the, his gaming um, was quite useful to learn these digital skills. But as we know, pupils will need to adapt to tech changes at speed. 
Pupils need to engage in technology from an early age to become fluent in the digital world. They need to be active learners, self-reflective and motivated to ask questions. They need to seek different sources of answers and cross-reference skill sets. Here's another little bit of audio from a 12 year old boy. In Minecraft story mode, you are the character in the story. It's like doing a play. You are the character and you are the writer as well. So you make the decision in the game. So that's him giving feedback about how his Minecraft playing has helped him understand about what a character is. And he's transferred that skill into learning about plays and stories. So we need really to understand, um, the, the children need to understand and recognize what works best for them. And they need to grow up to be confident, lifelong learners. And I think confidence is key here. So remember, remembering the digital revolution, that it wasn't until the 1990s that we had access to the internet at all. And the way we grew up, those of us born before 2000, um, we, we grew up with access to parks and theatres and museums, but all of our learning was really based on the needs of the material child, a child in presencia. And that before the disruption of digital media, mental models of the world were constructed in real time among peers where others inhabited the same physical space and sounds and smells to seeing were part of that experience. Interpersonal relations were tried and tested. Playgrounds and classrooms formed boundaries and safe spaces. Even if it was far from a perfect environment, it was stable and had been experienced by the teachers and governing bodies for generations. But as the 21st century settled in, we saw other purveyors of information taking our focus into computer-led media outlets. We all became avid emailers without a lesson. And how many mistakes did we make there? We hooked on to online entertainment, and when YouTube was launched in 2005, we all entered into another unknown world, unfamiliar to a generation born before 1990, but completely normal to our children. So at the moment, we're, we're really um, experiencing this collision of generational knowledge. And from 2005, anyone with internet access could enter this world. And however old you were, you, if you could work the computer, you could get access to this text, visual, visual audio content, which was first at work and then at home. And these boundaries were blurred. But children are growing up with this sense of normality with these blurred boundaries, and they're quicker at understanding these new functions and they are developing digital skills, but we still don't really know what they're learning. So the global pandemic was a big fast forward for digital children. Um, in 2018, just before the pandemic, the essential digital skills framework was outlined by the government. And the government said that we needed our children to be ready with these five essential skills when they leave school. They, they need to be able to do these things online, communicate, handle information and content, track, problem solve, and be safe and legal. Around a fifth of the UK population do not have these digital skills defined by the government. And research shows that there are many inequalities in digital skills and those without formal qualifications are less likely to have digital skills for life. In 2020, we found that 93% of people with a university degree would have these skills, whereas 34% would not have those without formal qualifications. So adult and distance learning has been on for a relatively long time, almost as long as that film I showed you at the beginning. And it was born out of that easiness that we had 
to create films from the 60s, but it was still very much confined to certain people making films. It was not a democratic process at all. Very few people would have had cameras to make films and especially broadcast them. But the BBC, as we know, got together with the Open University and we have had adult distance learning since 1971. But the first online adult learning began in 1985, and that was for a very small amount of the public. 1995 held the first doctoral student, and MOOCs became a big thing from 2012 with massive open online courses. Now, these adult courses are always, and still today, if we go to the London Business School, they will tell you they're user-friendly, they're easy to navigate, you study at your own pace, there's time to familiarise learning processes, course overview, reminders, tutor feedback, assistance with technical resources. Now, this was developed, if you think about it, over a good 20 years and then by MIT 2012. So before the pandemic, adults had had, those who were working with digital media in any way, had had some access to some guidelines on how to learn online. But during the pandemic, where were the guidelines for teachers and parents? What training did teachers and educators receive? And what about SEND pupils, pupils with disabilities and teachers who could not work on screens? What was the advice on blended learning or analog materials? I questioned this. I had four children at home, four with very different learning needs and I received no advice whatsoever. During 2020, the school lockdown began and there was a report that came out in the May of 2020 um, by the government, learning during the lockdown, real-time data on children's experiences. And the big sort of takeaway from that was, yes, it's gonna be disrupted. We're not quite sure how harmful it will be. And we know that um, there was no precedent in our modern times, I suppose, in our lifetime of this kind of situation. But we did have some precedent in adult education. So here were some of the feedbacks from that report. Primary and secondary students spend about five hours on average on home learning. Secondary school children will have more likely to on class and spend leisure time online. Higher income parents are more likely um, that then they're less well off to report that their school, schools provide online classes. 64% of secondary pupils from the richest household are being offered help. 47% from the poorest. 82% of secondary schools attending private school were offered help, 79 being online. Um, children in the highest income families spent five point hours a day on educational activities, but 30% less for the poorer families. So parents, of course, were struggling with this. 60% of parents um, from primary schools um, and nearly half of parents from secondary reported that were finding it hard or very hard to support this. And whatever strategy the government pursues after reopening, meaning now, there is still a risk of these increased inequalities. So that's all in a way the status quo. And there's been a fair amount of work within anthropology about anthropology and education. And I feel that anthropologists could really give some insight into how education may understand itself in the future. When you learn a new language or study cultures on their own terms, you're on your way to becoming an anthropologist. You construct alternative mental landscapes of the world or even new worlds which challenge your existing concepts. And just what just happened? This time the cultural others are not somewhere beyond, they're not from different ethnicities or different um, backgrounds, they're actually our own children. So this is a, we, we could help looking at this new digital culture. Um, this is um, a little, a tiny little extract from a film I made about 
what anthropologists are. And this is narrated by uh, Professor Alan McFarlane from the University of Cambridge. Anthropology is a very strange discipline because in most subjects like history or chemistry or whatever it is, you go and study objects out there and it doesn't really change you as a person. They are the past or your experiments. In anthropology, the whole point was you went out to a magical land. When you go to a tribal society like the Nagas or Highland New Guinea, you went to ma a magical world, which is something like our childhoods, rather like Alice uh, through the looking glass. Okay. Oh, sorry, move on. So, um, the ethnographic method is a resource. I'm just going to give some general big um, statements here because I know time is short. So, I'm just going to say that. Understanding the cultures of the digital, we must really break it down into a more of a granular form, that it's not just the digital world and us. There are many types of digital worlds. There's binary, non-linear, there's an interactive, HCI engagement, immersion types of digital. There's hypertextual, um, linked, layered, hypermediacy, virtual, postmodern, blurring boundaries, networked, connected, decentralized, stimulated, recreation, representation, and simulacra. So there are many different types of ways that people are, are interacting with the digital. And anthropologists and the work that we're doing within digital anthropology really bring about certain ways of, of, of going about field work. Um, we look we recognize that like culture, it changes. The consumer engagement experience changes. It's fluid and drastic changes are common. And like technology, digital practices evolve and transform. And a holistic understanding is key and also their ephemeral nature. So in anthropology, we have ethnographic method. Now, the, the, one of the key things in the ethnographic method is the participant observation method. And it means that you experience life, the life of the people you are studying. Um, you um, collect data by not just looking at the child's performance in school or on paper. We look at it in terms of home language and school language. We explain in simple language and often with the help of a translator. And we want the child or the children to participate in activities and, it, and understand what the point is of these activities obviously gaining permission or the ethical backgrounds that we do in any, any um, subject of a human subject study. Um, and we, we also spend time with the children and we learn their games. We learn what they're doing so that we can understand where they're coming from. We ask the children about their digital recreation and their online cultures. We don't see it as an us and them. We try to really get involved and understand um, what kind of games they're looking at and, and how these are affecting schoolwork. We participate and we observe and we create space for the child to voice opinions. So these are some of the things we translate as anthropologists, we translate culture, we try to see it on its own terms and we don't judge where people are coming from. We don't change the children's verbal expressions. If they have another use of a word, we use it because that might give more insight into what they're trying to tell us. And we ask them to respond to stories and illustrative messages. So these are a few of the others I can share with you later because I don't want to run out of time. Um, and we interpret, we interpret what's going on in its context, in its world, 
And um, for example, if we attempt to understand from a child's point of view, if the child does not want to learn online, we also use our empathetic knowledge. And we think, would I have wanted to sit at a desk for five hours a day when I was eight, year, eight years old? Um, why we mustn't be led by the digital, we lead it. And then we collaborate. Everything we do is we collaborate. And a couple of things here is that we include teachers, parents, grandparents in understanding the, um, the, the, the development of a child to try and close the information and the generation gap. And we try to communicate well. Um, we don't expect the children to do things that we wouldn't want to do ourselves. Um, so I'm just going to introduce you quickly to um, a film that my student has made. And really, this is the takeaway. If you want to teach people a new way of thinking, don't bother trying just to tell them, which will lead to new ways of thinking. So I'm going to come out of this now, and I'm going to just let you see um, five or so minutes of my student's film. So this is called COVID Classroom. I'm going to stop share and then I'm going to reshare. Are you still with me, everybody? <laughs> yep. Yes. OK, so I'm going to just share you this um, share screen so that we um, OK, share screen. And I'm going to show you this is by a wonderful student who had not had any anthropological training apart from um, the ethnographic filmmaking course she came on this summer. She wanted to make a film about her experience and the experience of two um, lesser, um, let's say, um, lesser helped children um, in her community. Um, so we're going to see it and then she's here if we could, if you have any questions. So this is just the beginning. It's a wonderful film of 35 minutes and I'm sure she'd allow you to see it another time. Can you see the screen? It's been one and a half years since schools around the world have been forced to close their doors due to the COVID-19 pandemic. According to UNICEF, schools for more than 16 million children globally have been completely shut for most of the last academic year. As the death rate climbed, my school was quick to adapt to our rapidly changing world. I had all the support I could possibly need. Remote learning tools had been put in place, infrastructure and strategies on how me as a child of my school could learn in the most effective way possible. Along with all of this, I also had my family every step of the way. However, through it all, I couldn't help but wonder if I had somehow not have access to any of this, none of the privileges I have access to simply because of circumstances I cannot control, how would I cope was all that I could ask. Unfortunately, this hypothetical question of mine is but a reality for millions of children from low-income backgrounds in India. How are they coping? And how much worse has our educational crisis become? Plato believed that education was a means for both individual and social justice. To achieve social justice, he argues, we must all work in harmony. This, he opines, can be achieved by equal educational opportunities for all. Without this, we may see the emergence of a tyrannical society ran by unqualified people. The importance of education is nothing unheard of, which is why now more than ever, people and government are willing to invest in a quality education or educational opportunities and infrastructure for all. However, it is important to realize that ultimately, no matter how much you spend or theorize, it all boils down to what actually happens in the classroom. It is with this intention that I decided to examine an actual classroom to see how the learning is actually taking place amidst the COVID crisis. 
Over the next 30 minutes, I will be presenting a case study. A COVID classroom through the eyes of a 16 year old right before you. This is a case study of a brother and a sister who despite the COVID crisis and all the difficulties that came with it, try their best to keep their fire for learning alive. In order to conduct the study effectively, I decided to try and learn the fundamentals of and train myself in educational research. From my understanding, one of the most critical aspects of educational research or research in general is research ethics. The inherent need to respect people's data and privacy is especially relevant here when working with children, which is why even though I have taken the informed consent of both parents and children, I have chosen to keep their identities anonymous. I felt that perhaps their consent was tainted by the fact that they may have felt compelled to do so. Furthermore, I believe that their identities are irrelevant in comparison to their story, as it is a story shared by millions of children all around the world. I have thus given them new names to protect their identity. I have named the girl Asha, which means hope in Hindi. This represents the hope that is still there despite all of the difficulties that have come in their educational journey. The boy I've named Bala, which represents the strength that they have and will need in their educational journey. In his thesis, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire states that to be educated is to escape from the necrophilic clutches of oppression. He continues this line of thought by saying that to question is what humanizes us. On the first day of recording, I was eager to see the power of education at first hand. With excitement and slight apprehension, I walked up the stairs. Their home consisted of one room and a bathroom. Whatever was overflowing in terms of this household was neatly compartmentalized into the carry bags that hung off the wall. And of course, there was one small window to see the outside world. And in the midst of it all was a classroom, a classroom that many people would not be able to recognize. Whilst considering on our learning, our focus is fixated on the mobile rather than the learning environment that it rests in. Frederick Vogel constantly stressed on the learning environment of a child. Okay, so I've um, just, um, that was, uh, it's difficult sometimes to know at which point to bring you into a film when you're not watching the whole film. But what I wanted to include there, rather than explain to you the methodologies that we use, was to show you the methodologies that we use. So Navia Sara is here, and I just wanted to ask her three questions to give you a little bit of the feedback of the ethnographic method within the audiovisual. So welcome, Navia. Sara, thank you for joining us from India this evening. Thank you for having me. Okay, well done. Um, so I, I had a, a couple of questions about the use of um, the camera and the use of audio became an eth ethnographic filmmaker so we've only got five minutes but we we'll just maybe um explain to people who would not perhaps be familiar with this method what how you sort of learned from that kind of workshop um to tell your story about the children yeah so um i don't really have much experience in anthropology but um the, there's a lot of overlapping between visual anthropology and documentary making. And I learned a lot about, I think Alison also mentioned uh, just now, the participatory mode uh, of filmmaking, uh, and which basically includes the perspective of the filmmaker. Um, so that's one thing that I um, used in my documentary. Um, along with this, um, I learned a lot about um, camera angles and um, how they could possibly um, convey a power dynamic. So um, if my camera angle is looking from 
above to someone below me, it kind of insinuates that I'm looking down on them. So that's just um, an example of how um, you have to be mindful and sensitive to the people who you are um, asking questions from or recording. Um, so um, I made sure to keep my documentary at eye level so that I wasn't disrespecting anybody. Um, I also ensured uh, to uh, take the consent of everybody that I was uh, recording so that I didn't disrespect them in any way. Um, I also um, learned about the visual impact of um, film and uh, it kind of informed my decision to make this into a documentary and not a research paper or an article because simply because of the visual impact. Um, and you can see it in movements, um, for example, like in the civil rights movement, uh, the use of photos, there's a lot of use of photos to convey this emotional impact on people and it worked very effectively. And also I wanted to uh, share it with a wider audience because it's more easily communicated and understood and um, you know, kind of uh, surpasses any boundaries that you know, prevents people from like reading research papers and you know, all that. Wow. Thank you very much, Arya Sara. Um, if you, um, it's a shame, if you wanted to watch um, the film uh, complete, I'm, I'm sure we'll ask Navia Sara if, if anybody would like to see that, but she really captures, and, and um, we didn't quite get to that bit, uh, the, the frustration of these children who were sharing a mobile phone between them and how the teachers were really trying to get information across, but the noise outside was interfering. And these, it was very symbolic of all the noise that was going on around families during COVID and really demonstrated it was a one size fits all. And if you can't grasp what was going on there and then you were lost. Um, and so I think this was really well illustrated that whole corporeal holistic understanding of the experience of, of, of the digital classroom and um, how so many people would, would not get any learning out of it. And Navia Sara's reflective account all the way through is very self-reflexive. And I think as a 16 year old um, who has really learned about the meta of, of, of um, learning, it, I think this film is a very good example of a simple methodology that tells us an awful lot about um, some of the innovations that might be needed to connect the, the message with the learner in the future. So I better stop there. Thank you so much for joining us, Navi Asara, and maybe um, we'll continue to talk about certain things in the next session. Thank you, Eve. I'll stop Thank there. you so much. I'm sorry I had to cut that short, but no, I, I'd love to see the whole movie. Yeah. I think, you know, especially some of the elements you, you brought forward were, you know, I think it really made me think about the digital divide, isn't it? It's the whole issue with education being a risk factor for early dependency, morbidity. And it is that that also inhibits access to digital means and, and perhaps digital understanding. So how to work with this? I think both of you have really given a good handle on really and it's something that came up with what tracy said earlier is to work from the people you're developing this for because a lot of apps a lot of technology is developed by uh, nerds who you know come up with great and wonderful ideas but it's that translation to the people we're actually designing it for to enable them to work and something you brought up, Navishara, which is really important, is that a lot of people won't have access. And something you brought up, um, you know, Alison, that poor families perhaps will not have access to a uh, laptop. So who's going to pay for this? Who will provide that access? Is there any way? You know, it's something we need to think about because with more libraries closing, this further inhibits access to uh you know uh online um availability exactly and also this sole dependency mm. i think 
think this is a, you know, it's a um, bit of a red herring sometimes. Um, but your many generations have learned an awful lot from reading, writing, drawing from the library, exactly. And, yeah. and suddenly turning everything over to digital, it may have been better to spend money buying people books and finding extra tuition for smaller groups rather than this one size fits all get online for five hours a day um analog can work as well so we're looking yep. at blended learning as well um and and the idea of um not putting everything over to the digital and i think um some of the well i mean in Aviasara shows you the coping skills of those children were more important in a way than what they were learning on screen because the way they were sharing the way they were you know they were mm. on their own all day mm. they were age nine and eleven and now yes, I was 16 so and how brilliantly that little group of children work together to yeah. create this movie yeah you know that is another what an amazing thing to have been able to organize so these are other skills kind of beyond the beyond the margins mm. that, that are not tested in the way that um you know that the, the education system is testing there there are many skills that that children need to learn that okay. go beyond um the text and i think many people have known that for years but this this relates also to something we found we, we years ago we did a program for older people and digital inclusion and people were found to learn best from their peers it's because you speak that same language don't you like your kids together Sarah, work together you know speaking that same language understanding that place where, where they're coming from I'm going to not open up the discussion because I'm mindful of the time at this point, but I want to keep have everybody like I've made lots of notes on my form. Uh, please, you know, thoughts you have about the wonderful lecture that Alison gave and and Navashara, you know, your 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 movie was very very impressive, and I'm I'm really sorry I cut that short, but no, it's, no, we, it's we knew I, that you would only have five minutes, so don't yeah, worry. But it, it, what what I saw really made me want to look at this. This is this is amazing. It's an amazing job, you know, that you you managed to do that. Kudos to you. Um, I'm going to continue with the next speaker. Thank you so much, Alison. And uh, our next speaker, so we now have a